Hey, Nora. Hey, Sandy. Mm. A lot more of the same this week, huh? Yeah. Oh, my God. We're going to have another another episode about what is going on, what is being said, how to understand it. Um, it's, it's pretty horrible. It's horrible and horrifying. And um, it just, it gets, it gets worse and, and uh, like dizzyingly, rhetorically absurd uh, each day. And um, like, I just, I, again, am, I'm just stunned at uh, the moral bankruptcy of uh, of world leaders, including our own. Yeah, I have a lot to say. I know that you have a lot to say. So let's get into uh, everything that we need to do. I haven't asked how you are, and I'm going to need you to ask me how I am, but after we do the thank you. So Sandy, other than what we've all just said, how are you? You know, I'm doing pretty good because we have a live show coming up and like, we'll do the like real Ah! announcement about that later. But I also have like a medical procedure coming up. And for a second, I thought I wasn't going to Winnipeg. Like, you know this, Nora, but (laughs) there was, there was a second where it was like, oh, the only day that you can do this, um, this is the day before, uh, you're supposed to be in Winnipeg. And I would not recover in time for that. And I was really, really sad, but uh, things have worked in my favor and I will be in Winnipeg. So that's really great. I got to be honest with you, Sandy, when you sent me the message saying, good news, it's all good. I'll be there. I had like three kilograms lifted off of my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> that is so wonderful. I'm so glad. Um, yeah. So, so we'll see you in Winnipeg. More on that in a second. But the other thing You know, Nora, last week we were talking about having difficult conversations with people. Remember that? Yep, I sure do. Literally, like right after we recorded, I was faced with uh, one of the most difficult conversations I've had with uh, with a neighbor that I went uh, to go get some food with, uh, talking about the war and, uh, and being very much on opposite sides of the issue and being like, okay, well, you know, this is, you know, this might be one of the hardest conversations that I'll have about this, um, just because of what our different positioning was and, you know, did the thing, did the thing, uh, that we implore all of our listeners to do, which is to stick it out and have that conversation and to poke the holes where you can, because it's in these types of relationships that doors are open to um, understanding something different. And uh, I don't think I made a 180 uh, turn in this person, but I certainly poked some holes and got them thinking differently. And I think that that those types of conversations are just reminded right after our podcast recording of how important they are. And so, um, you know, I'm encouraging folks, I know everyone's, you know, getting out on the street and doing what they can. Um, those, those types of difficult conversations don't avoid them. They are so important. Totally, totally. And I have a question then, what's it gonna be like the next time you guys see each other? Or have you already seen each other since? We have not seen each other since, but we have spoken since. And it's, I mean, it's very likely we're going to see each other. We, we are neighbors and, you know, uh, exist in this um, small kind of neighborhood together. Uh, And it was fine. It was great. It was uh, talking about the next time we were going to see one another. So, you know, our, our relationship, I don't think suffered as a result. Um, But what I do think is that, uh, you know, our, we were able to, to like literally have a conversation about, you know, what is true and what is not and what could be true and what couldn't be true and what, you know, what we were listening to, what was um, influencing us and actually come to some agreements on some, some policy issues, which it didn't look like it was, was going to happen at the beginning of the conversation. And this, I mean, this was a hard conversation that was over an hour and a half, maybe over two hours long. We were with each other for quite some time and we were going toe to toe on, on stuff. And it's, I'll say that, you know, it's difficult to have some of these conversations because so, 
So much of the rhetoric, um, and we'll get into this on this episode, I think, is like it, I think I mentioned this to you before, that it, it almost feels like arguing um, with someone who's anti-vax because so much of the rhetoric comes down to, well, that's propaganda. And so you shouldn't mm-hmm. believe that. Um, whether we're talking about uh, death tolls or um, things that, that Israel has admitted to doing, um, you know, that was so often the response was, well, well, that's just propaganda from terrorists. And so, you know, trying to figure out how to poke holes in that argument and like what things are undeniable and forcing someone to face those those undeniable truths and then, you know, saying like, how can one defend this? And and having that conversation, it was hard. It was a hard uh, conversation to have, but it, I think it was really necessary, and I think it was positive. And I think that our next conversation will perhaps be more of the same. But the the thing that's of critical importance, I think, is that because we have a, a friendship that existed beforehand, we are able to have a conversation where they can listen to me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's actually interesting that you had that experience right after we recorded, because I know a lot of people really connected with what you were saying last week about needing to reach across. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like we got a lot about that. We got a lot of replies from people saying that that they were really felt energized and turned on and excited by your comments specifically about doing that. So, I mean, that's life and you live life. And of course that's going to happen to you too. So I'm, I'm, I, I love that. I love that. Um, I love that the stuff that we talk about on this podcast is so real and applicable to existence that, uh, that it can then be used by us too. Yeah. <laughs> the day after we record. <laughs> yeah, totally. And like, look, it, like I said at last week, it was uncomfortable. I'm not going to deny that. It was like uncomfortable to realize that we were on different sides of this issue. <laughs> and it was uncomfortable to be like, well, we could just have this really nice brunch, but instead mm. uh, we're going to have an argument <laughs> for brunch. And uh, it was uncomfortable, but uh, yeah. Totally. What a small price. Let's do some gratitude and then let's talk about Winnipeg. So this week, thank you so, so much. Lots of folks sharing the podcast, especially on Instagram. And you all know I'm not super good at Instagram, but I try to be not the worst person in the Instagram world. You know what, um, Nora? And I don't think I'm the worst. I, I want I want to let you know that, uh, you know, some people <laughs> may know that I'm, I'm doing some work in TV and film. And one of my partners was like, Nora is the best at Instagram. Can we please hire her to do our Instagram? And I was like, is this a joke? And she was like, I am truly not is joking. This the worst idea? I love everything that Nora does on the Sandy and Nora uh, Instagram page can we ask Nora? And I was like, Nora would never do that, but I also would never ask because no. she's actually terrible at it. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> not everybody <laughs> shares my opinion. So there you go. Wow. Yeah, they should though. Cause you're right. And you, do you want someone who hates movies promoting your movies? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe actually, I don't know. Um, you know what? This week we had a lot of folks show a lot of support. So I'll, thank you so much for the suggestions and the sharing of the episodes. Uh, we we really rely on you for that. And also thanks to everybody who changed their donation at patreon.com at Sandy and Nora uh, or, or donated for the first time, especially this week. Thanks to Mark, Lou, Samuel, Ghost Porcupine, Laura, Kathleen, Nathan, Alex, and Charlotte, thank you so much. Okay, so everyone, November 24th, if you are in Winnipeg or if you're close to Winnipeg, if you want to, you've been thinking about a reason to go to Winnipeg, November 24th is the day to go to Winnipeg because we will be there at the Winnipeg West End Cultural Center doing a live show of Sandy and Nora. And you don't want to miss it. You can get your tickets just like before on thepointofsale.com. Just search Sandy and Nora in Winnipeg. It'll come up and uh, you can buy your tickets there. 
Mm -hmm. And don't forget to tell your friends about it. The number of people I found uh, after our Toronto show who were like, "Why you did a Toronto show? It's like, uh, we can't, we, it's hard to advertise this stuff. I don't know what to tell you. We need your help. So if you're in Winnipeg, you got friends in Winnipeg, tell them about the show. It's going to be lots of fun. And, and, you know, who doesn't want to be together on a snowy November night at the end of November in Winnipeg? Oh, I'm so excited. So excited. Yes. Okay. So Sandy, ask me how I am. I'm I'm nervous to do this, but I, I'm, I hope you're okay. But I'm going to ask, how are you? <laughs> okay, so I am really good. Oh, I'm really really good. What? Okay, I've that's talked not what a I was couple expecting. of times. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talked a couple of times on the show about the transit campaign in Quebec City, right? And this is the kind of campaign, I mean, like, it doesn't make any sense, but like the transit campaign here is so vicious that like people have been charged with criminal harassment of the mayor. Uh, People have vandalized my apartment with like anti tramway slogans that they've written on it. Um, I get really horrific messages from people who are like really, really anti tramway. And in the last week, the government of Quebec announced that it is rejecting the city's plan for the tramway that has been in the works for two and a half years now, and they want to delay it by six months. Wait. And they're sending it to something called the CAIS. Yeah. Sorry, you said that you were doing great. I'm not at the great part yet. Okay. All right, continue. It was a bombshell of an announcement, uh, and, it, and it threw people for a loop because, I mean, the work has already started. Like construction literally on my block all the last two weeks has been, and all summer, has been related to the tramway. And so here's the Premier of Quebec looking at the polls and saying, oh, you know what? Quebecers don't want it. We're going to can this project or delay it for six months, which is, you know, potentially putting it into, into jeopardy. And so... I have this like very fake and loose group and I say a fake group because it's only a Facebook thing. There's not really anything that exists outside of it. And I've been, I've been feeling the need to call a meeting. So we called a meeting, 25 people showed up to this meeting, which is pretty good. It was an online meeting. We come up with like some subcommittees and a couple of loose plans. And then, and that was Monday night. And then Wednesday night, the government announces they're rejecting the plan and they're throwing it back to the drawing board. And so we call a rally. We're like, fuck it. it we got to do a rally. So Friday morning, massive press conference, wall-to-wall media coverage. And today, Sandy, do you know how many people came out to our last-minute emergency Save the Tramway rally? Oh, gosh. I don't know. How many people? 4,000. Four, yeah, no. 4,000 people showed up at a park in downtown Quebec City saying that they wanted to save the tramway. And everybody had big smiles. There were amazing homemade signs. I mean, our level of coordination was very, very low. So, like, we've got, we've got like, placards that you can put in your window to say that you want the tramway. So we just brought those. And it was 4,000 people marching from La Grand Théâtre down to the National Assembly. And, I mean, it was so big that, like, you know, most people listening to this podcast won't know what this means, but, like, I got pushed towards this interview. They're like, oh my God, Nora, you have to do this interview. Go, 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 go. And I get pushed. And this guy's like, who's the spokesperson? And I'd already talked to TVA. I already talked to Radio Canada. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know who this guy is. I, I, I don't really, um, you know, I've, I've lived here for 10 years, but I don't, or 11 years, but I don't know all Quebec kind of like personalities. And they're like, it's her. She's the spokesperson. Nora, you're going to be on Info Man. <laughs> I don't get it. Sandy, that's the biggest deal in this province. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> in- Info Man, to put it into perspective, Info Man is what like made Jack Layton win his election. Oh, shit. Okay. Because he was on, he played a game with them, he was charming, and they were like, okay, that's enough. We like this guy. So, I mean, I, I was like, okay, I-, I don't know who they are. It's not a big deal to me. But um, as I was talking to him, there's like this group of about 50 people like rallied behind me. They're like trying to get on the camera on InfoMan. Like, it's a big deal. And so we have this amazing rally and this huge show of support. And the anti tramway people, they had called a rally before us for some reason. I'm not sure why. And because of Remembrance Day, everything got pushed to Sunday. So their rally was like actually almost at the same time as ours. And only 50 people showed up. Oh my God. Yeah. So we are ready. We are kicking the premier in the nuts. We have kicked him in the nuts. I'm so excited about this campaign. I don't know where we go from here because it's not canceled. It's being pushed to the case for another review. And the people at the case that are doing the review have already done the review. So I don't know where this leaves us, but I just got in. I just, I'm still cold. I'm still cold. 
And um, and we timed it so that people could stay for the Palestinian rally after. And it was just like amazing, 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 amazing. So I am great. Some power of the people. And sometimes, folks, all it takes is literally the one or two people to call it. And in this case, it was literally just me and someone who knew we had to do it, someone who's politically connected, who was like, uh, this has to happen. And, the t- and together, the two of us, we pushed out all the volunteers, we pushed out everything we needed to do, and we got it together. And there we were, 4,000 people strong in downtown Quebec City. Look, I mean, I, I said it at one of the live shows we did recently that we haven't quite yet aired, um, uh, but we will at some point in the future, I think, uh, which is, fuck, the greatest secret of organizing is how few people it takes to actually yeah. make something massive happen. So congratulations. That's amazing. And that so- sort of massive show of support is the only kind of thing that turns these things around. And so I'm really optimistic about what's going to happen with this tramway. Congrats. Mm -hmm. I am too. I I had someone pull me over, a woman in her 60s, and she's like, I've never been to a protest in my life. And I was like, okay, okay, we've done something here. We're doing something here and we will do something here. So pretty nice, especially nice considering uh, the week that we've had. And so as I was organizing all this tramway stuff, uh, I was also researching this thing that was going on at Concordia. And so maybe we can start with that as the launch into the main topic on this episode. Sure. And so you have written uh, an investigative piece about this, I suppose. Uh, in, yeah. Is it the maple that you wrote it in? Yes. Tell us more about this action that happened at Concordia, the way that politicians responded to it and what was being talked about it online and what actually happened. Mm-hmm. So there is this clash at Concordia and a lot of people who are like, who've been around for a while, either in the student movement or in Montreal or in Anglo Montreal will remember that there have been historic clashes between activists that are pro-Palestine and activists that are pro-Israel. So, you know, eyes on Concordia kind of mean something a little bit more special than if we're talking like at Dalhousie or at University of Winnipeg. So that's a little bit of the background. This, you know, videos surface of, uh, of a clash, of, of a lot of yelling. The videos are all from the side of the pro-Israeli protesters. So they're all showing like very angry, very passionate protesters from the Palestinian side. And the news reports, you know, CTV, Montreal Gazette, and, and then of course politicians say this as well, that, that the students at Concordia, pro-Israeli students, held a vigil for the hostages that are still being held. And that pro-Palestinian activists showed up and attacked them during their vigil. And this was this is literally what they aired the the, the line from the the students that organized this pro-Israeli thing. And one of the videos is of a student who's very angry and is yelling at someone, and we can't see who they're yelling at because the camera is being pointed from the pro-Israel side. And the student calls someone a cunt and a bitch, and this gets turned into the student using the K word, a very, very horrible slur for Jews. And it becomes like exploding anti-Semitism on our campuses is the line. Now, importantly to note, this is also happening at the same time that two Jewish schools get shot at. So, and there's been a third Jewish school that has been shot at as well in Montreal. So there is increasing anti-Semitism and violent anti-Semitic acts, but this Concordia thing gets lumped in to that increasing anti-Semitism as if to say, oh my God, the the Israeli students can't even have a vigil without being attacked by the pro-Palestinian side. I did see some of that also uh, going around online, and it it seems like there's a a lot of, uh, um, like, mishearing words that is being described as anti-Semitism online. I I saw another um, uh, tweet that was, like, uh, calling out Trudeau and, uh, and... Uh, an organization uh, claiming that uh, another slur was being used, uh, another anti-Semitic slur was being used uh, by these people who were calling out Trudeau. So it was um, uh, very, very muddled. So what actually happened? You spoke to some of the students who were there, right? I spoke to quite a few students who were there. And it's really a fascinating kind of example of how propaganda is so easily made out of anything. So here you have two tables that get booked beside each other. Administrative error from the student union, and they've admitted that. 
And one of the tables is booked by Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights, SPHR. They are selling kafeas, and the kafeas are to fundraise for people in Gaza, and they're trying to mobilize people for an action on Thursday, the day after. At the same time, at the next table over is a table booked by Hillel, and Hillel is a Jewish student life group on campus. They exist all across Canada. Hillel offers their table to this group that was just founded in the summer called Startup Nation. And the idea of Startup Nation is that Israel is the only true, really true startup nation in the world, that it's a startup and it's it's technologically, I don't even know, advanced and cool and all the good stuff about startups all wrapped up in the nation of Israel. So this is a group that is like a Zionist group, a nationalist group for Israel. And they have a vigil, and the vigil uh, has a table setting for Shabbat to recognize that there are people who are being held hostage who cannot, who have not come home for Shabbat yet. And on the other side is this this lineup of people for kafeas, and there are more than a hundred people in line for kafeas. They run out; they have to get more. It's like really, really popular. And for a couple of hours, the two groups are are fine. They're operating side by side, and there's no problems. But when the folks from SPHR showed up to set everything up, some group and Startup Nation was one to take it down. So we can assume it was Startup Nation plastered the first floor of the building with posters, including all over the escalators, which felt pretty hostile to the students uh, with uh, SPHR. It was also not allowed. They had to take the posters down. The students with the vigil also had signs, like they had protest signs. Um, One sign, to give you an example, was like Christians United for Israel. And uh, it's kind of interesting that your vigil has protest signs, but okay. So this side of the cafe purchasers have no signs. It's just a cafe purchasing event, right? And eventually groups, uh, people come from outside. Uh, I have to say it was really cute. I think almost all of the students that I talked to, they were like, yeah, you know, and then adults showed up. <laughs> guys, we're not that old, (laughs) but like people who are off campus, who are not students. And then there was like some pretty open harassment. And, uh, and in the end, it was the Palestinian students that get pushed out of the space, pushed onto the street, overly policed. Uh, there was a Palestinian activist who was, uh, arrested for assaulting a security guard. What I understand is that the security guard put hands on her and she reacted, um, not arrested as the guy who we've got video of kicking someone in the face or at the top of the chest. So, you know, Clash, I think you can say that. There was definitely a clash, definitely a big debate, uh, big big arguments and lots of yelling. Um, but did the pro-Palestinian students show up to target a vigil for missing hostages from Israel? Absolutely not. I think that we can say that with pretty much certainty that that's not what happened. Jeez, you know, like that whole thing, like being reported in the way that it was, it's just so... Um, it's like just such so emblematic of how this entire war is going and how everything is being presented to us. There's like things that you can see with your eyes or verify with people um, directly that are being talked about as if they're the complete opposite of what's really happening. And it it truly is a mind fuck. And it is so like enraging, but also a little bit confusing. Like uh, I say confusing, understanding that like, yeah, I totally get this. Like I understand why this is happening. I, I understand the politics of settler colonialism and so on. But I am, I guess I'm just still a little bit stunned at how willing many uh, world leaders are to even throw away their own power, it seems like, because the amount of people that are getting out on the street f- for to, to support Palestinians and to say, at the very least, there should be a ceasefire. But I, again, many of these protests are, are going even beyond that. They're saying, you know, like, stop the siege. Uh, they're saying, stop the occupation. Um, at the very least, you know, to, to call for a ceasefire, a lot of these politicians are, it seems like, willing to, to throw away their own power in their own countries to uphold the, the really, like, the ugly lies that are being told to justify uh, collective punishment. And that, to me, like, is 
is confusing. It is stunning. Like I, I see the the shift of uh, Macron, and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, the the French. Uh, the, you know, the fucking Macron being like changing his rhetoric on this and saying, you know, I am now going to call for a ceasefire. You know, that to me makes sense in a world where today, on the day that we're recording this Sunday, there's over a hundred thousand French people on the ground protesting. And I, it's just so bizarre to me that that isn't. I think it will eventually happen, but it's it it is it has taken quite some time for world leaders to to really shift where they're at on this. Well, and they need it, right? Like the fact that um, member of cabinet Mark Miller and other politicians were sharing this stuff from Concordia as like proof of uh, a rise in anti-Semitic acts, as if. This isn't like two sides of a really pressing global issue. Like, give me a break, man. Like the, the, this, this, and then of course, Sija sharing this, uh, this, this lying about what students are saying at a high school because the high school is majority Muslim. I mean, the racism is just like horrific and disgusting. But this is the, 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 the contortions that we are subject to while our politicians maintain a position that is untenable. You know, the information coming out of, out of Al-Shifa Hospital uh, in the last 24 and 36 hours is is unbelievable. You've got Médecins Sans Frontières saying, oh, my God, like, who is listening to us? Who is listening to us? And you have Zionists online saying, well, uh, MSF are actually uh, anti-Semites. <laughs> it's like no one believes you. No one believes you that Doctors Without Borders is actually an anti-Semitic organization. Not a single fucking person believes you. Why are you saying that? And it's because these contortions um, are, are, are more deep and, and, and more ridiculous as the untenable continues to get defended. And, you know, I'll mention Jesse Brown. I mean, Jesse Brown from Canada Land has been saying also similarly bizarre things like, oh, this Jewish owned bookstore has been uh, attacked. And you're like, oh, my God. OK, let's click. Oh, you're talking about Chapters Indigo. Uh, okay, I guess it's Jewish owned. Uh, Heather Reisman is the owner and she literally gives money to like the IDF <laughs> and have they've been protested for years. And, oh, why don't you guys, of course, why aren't you targeting own, uh, businesses that aren't owned by Jews? And it's like, oh, actually they were. Here's all the actions that we have been doing. You know, it, it, it's an untenable position to hold. And the contradictions, as they become more and more untenable, will become more and more r ridiculous, which, as you called it, is a mind fuck. We are getting mind fucked right now. And it feels really weird, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, totally. You know, at, in one of the you know, weird things that you learn in law school is like to, <laughs> to take facts and make completely opposite arguments off of the same facts, right? Like you, you can take oh, facts right. and like make an argument um, based on the facts and what the facts are telling you. And then you can make a completely different argument, like a totally 180 argument based on the same facts if you are talented enough at doing that. And that's like one of the things that you're like, trained to do uh, because you know if you are in if you're in the middle of some sort of court case and you 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 can't argue on the facts the facts are there the defense needs to argue something completely different than the prosecution right and it's like it's like you know that's also ridiculous like as you sit there learning how to make facts look like they're they mean something different than what they mean like it's it's uh it's ridiculous like you're you're like wow this is immoral and ridiculous and so i like watching that happen on a on a massive scale with the consequences that are embedded is like you, like you mentioned Al Shifa Hospital, like I, I can't, I mean, I just, the news coming out of that hospital, the fact that the hospital is no longer operational, the destruction of the cardiac uh, ward, the, the people who have died who were in intensive care because there was no fuel, there was no electricity, there were no resources, people who should not have died. The the targeting by the tanks and snipers, people leaving the hospital patients because they're forced to. And 
and, you know, looking at all of that, you know, like not all of that. I know that there's some, you know, folks as uh, who are online who will say like, well, where, where are you getting your information from? Maybe that's not a trustworthy source, but they're coming from multiple sources, <laughs> including aid workers who were there on the ground and including the world fucking health organization. And to, to like, to look at that and then say anti-Semitism or to look at that and say, well, D D Hamas was there or something. It's just, it, it, I think, you know, propaganda is a really important tool, but to, to see the way that people are talking about these facts, this, 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 the way that uh, um, Indigo was discussed uh, by, by Jesse Brown, like all of that, that stuff is just so unconscionable. It's so, like, there's no justification. Like, just, like, look at what, Israel is saying itself, it's like, you, you watch that, you see that, you see the, the doctors, the nurses who are there, who are telling us directly what's happening. And then the response uh, from Netanyahu is like, no, this isn't true. We actually offered fuel to Al-Shifa Hospital and Hamas said no. And, and it's like, it's <laughs> yeah. like, what? What's happening? We found a pristine copy of Mein Kampf on a child. Like what? <laughs> it's it's unbelievable it's that one. Unbelievable. And you know, even you, I saw reported again recently in Canadian media that um, the hostage takers from October 7th had um, lots of materials on them that said, <laughs> that were like scribbled notes, kill as many people as possible, take as many hostages as possible. And it's just like, okay, mm. yeah, I mean, maybe someone wrote that down as a note, but I don't know if that's, that's something you're going to do. I don't know that you need that written down as a note, but it certainly really fits a nice narrative that, if, that you're trying to paint um, using social media and the fact that what is true, we, we live in a time where what is true is significantly contested all the time, even when we can verify the facts. And it's just frankly fucking unconscionable um, that, that this is the way that people are engaging in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a major antidote to all of this propaganda swirling around everywhere. And it was last night. I had dinner with someone who's from Gaza. And he's not just like originally from Gaza or anything. He came to Canada for a couple month research uh, fellowship, a, a partnership. The government of Quebec or the Quebec uh, Research Group, FRQNT, actually has this incredible program with Gazan professors where they can come to a Quebec university. There's about 30 of them chosen every period of time that the program runs. And this individual was part of that program. So he came to Canada two months ago or so. And he didn't bring his whole family. He has five children between the ages of eight months and 11 years old and a wife. And they were in East Gaza City. They lived in Gaza City in the eastern side uh, of, uh, of the place. Yeah. And so they fled. He showed us pictures of the rubble of their house. He showed us pictures of IDF tanks rolling down the streets of Gaza City. And he says, this is, this is my city. Like, the, imagine tanks rolling down your city. Like it's, it's impossible to imagine. And then you look at it and you're like, that, that's my city. And there's tanks rolling down it. There's pictures of Israeli soldiers holding up uh, Israeli flags as if they've reclaimed Gaza City for Israel, which is literally all that's happening here, right? Like, let's be very clear. And his family has fled to Han Yunus and he is stuck in Canada because he can't go back. He can't fly to Gaza right now. He can't meet them somewhere because they can't leave Gaza he can't apply for asylum in Canada because then he'd lose his passport. Any chance of seeing his family ever again soon goes out the window because of Canada's asylum claim system. And so what's he supposed to do? Luckily, the, the university is supporting him and he has a place to live and he's, and he's supported. He's able to survive. But he can't do anything. 
And so he says, well, what are my options? Like, how long would it take me to become a citizen if I, if I you know, called for asylum? Could I bring my family here? Could the Canadian government facilitate that? Could I go to anywhere else? Will my family be able to leave? What's the UN doing on all of this? And when are they dispatching displaced people or refugees? Or what's that process? And it's like, yeah, we, if you're Ukrainian, I actually have an answer for you. If you're Ukrainian, I could tell you what the answer is, but you're not. And there is no program to help people from Gaza. And so he is on his phone all the time. He's trying to be awake during the hours that people in Gaza are awake for news from his family. And they are alongside thousands of others who fled Gaza City. And I listen to this and it's like all of a sudden the propaganda vanishes. I see his Facebook feed. I see his pictures. I see the pictures of his children. I hear him talking in the present tense of his life that is gone and knowing just how obviously heartbroken and difficult this has been. I mean, we're in week five, so he's been going through hell for quite some time. And he tells me the, you know, in the conversations that he's had with his wife, she was so upset that they bought new uniforms and all the school supplies for the school year. And she couldn't stop thinking about that. And he had to say, stop thinking about that. It's no, like, who cares? It's the uniforms. We, you're survive. be alive, stay alive, stay alive. You can imagine that that just brings it right back down to the human And it gets right, cuts right through all of the bullshit so instantly. And of course, there's a reason why those kinds of voices are not the ones dominating coverage right now. We don't hear the voice of Gazans very often in Canadian media. And I think that that is a a brilliant time to bring up some reporting that has been really great. And that's the reporting that's being done by The Breach. Have you seen some of the reporting that they've been putting out lately? Totally. Big shout out to Emma Paling for all of that work. Really, really great work. And so just wanting, like, if you if you haven't read The Breach before, it's breachmedia.ca. And, you know, they are not uh, the type of journalistic organization who's going to be like, oh, there is no bias here. They're trying to actually report with analysis and uh, with, you know, being clear about what the analysis tells us. And one of the uh, reports that came out uh, this week, I believe it came out on November 11th, is a report on how CTV has been covering uh, what the, the conflict and what uh, what they are saying um, and how what they're saying, who it's coming from, how much uh, time, airtime is, is dedicated to voices from Palestinians, how, many, uh, how much airtime is dedicated to voices who are supporting Zionism. And I mean, I'm sure I'm not going to surprise anybody by telling you that it's 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 not great, folks, that the the analysis that they've put out um, shows that I'll just read the first line here. CTV National News has featured 62 percent more Israeli than Palestinian voices, aired racist stereotypes about Arabs and allowed Israeli military officials to make false claims without pushback in its month of coverage since October 7th. A comprehensive analysis by the breach has found. And it's like that kind of reporting that we have been really missing in Canada and missing in this conflict. And so shout out to the breach for that. And uh, I hope you all uh, take take a uh, a look at, at this report. Mm-hmm. And if you listen to the Daily News, I will have already mentioned it because it's on my list of things to talk about. We record on Sunday. You will hear that already. But it's such a good point that media is so implicated in this. And, you know, I noticed that yesterday for the first time since the uh, Hamas attack, the Canadian Association of Journalists finally made a statement, finally made a statement. It's embarrassing. Wow. How could it take them so long? This is the hold that Zionism has within the media. Like our media is 100% united for Israel, has been for a long time. It's very, very clear. There's been lots of studies on the the anti-Palestinian bias that is like permeates coverage of the Middle East. And here we are, like another example that that organization, the Canadian Journals for Free Expression, like an organization that apparently exists for free expression in this country. I haven't seen them comment on the global news journalist who was fired for uh, liking posts that related to Palestine. I, I haven't seen them comment on the conflict at all. It's total cowardice combined with Zionist sympathies, pro-Israel sympathies. That's it. And it's like, 
we see you, we see what you're doing, but it's hard to cut through it when there really aren't that many groups out there doing it. Right. And so, um, yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned the breach. And of course the Maple has been doing uh, a lot of its own uh, coverage as well. And it's, it's all to make sure that we don't actually believe or hear the stories of people whose lives are the ones that hang in the balance. You know, talking to my friend, like, like, you know, there's an ideal. Yes, we shouldn't have to leave. We want to stay here. This is our land. And then he's talking about how, you know, the, the water pumping stations are, are done. There's not enough fuel to run anything. Like everything is bombed out. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to get water. People are using seawater to wash their clothes and to wash their dishes they have to leave. He's like, we just need out. We have to be, we have to get out of Gaza. Like there's nowhere for us to be that safe. And again, it just clarifies things so directly. Not that the Israeli leadership is at all hiding this, which is the whole other thing, right? The way that the leadership in Israel talks about all this is like, you'd be called like anti-Semitic if you said that they said that the things that they're saying, (laughs) you know, like there's, they're being very honest about their goals here being ethnic cleansing, but it's, it is it is really, really difficult to to untie this stuff and to to maintain a level head, especially as the weeks drag on and we're in the street every week. And it gets, I mean, for us in Quebec City, it's getting much colder. Today's rally, I mean, today's rally was right after the transit rally. So by the time I hit hour three, I had to go in. I was freezing cold. But, you know, it's going to become more and more difficult as the winter goes on. And I'm 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 sitting here like, what what do we, what does it take? What does it take to change the, the minds of our government? How how can they be so callous, right? How can and I I know the answer, but like on a on a human level, how are they so depraved that they cannot take a position to just call for a ceasefire, let alone to call for the end of the occupation, let alone to use Canadian resources to help people in Gaza? No, like that's too far. Like just the ceasefire, we can't even talk about. Yeah, and even like I, I, you know, last week I asked like, what is the difference between a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire? It's like, what does that? What is what is the functional difference? What does that mean? And then this week, hearing Israel be like, okay, all right, there will be four hour pauses each day. Four hour pauses, like that. What that does is like tell us something about the scale of what's happening here. Four hour pauses. That's fucking outrageous. <laughs> That's unbelievable. That that is that is like the reality of what is happening and our government cannot call for a ceasefire. Um the the I mean what you're talking about too in in having the, these clarifying discussions with your friends it's like you know there's there are other roles that Canada could play like it like as you said like we did with um, providing a place for for refugees uh, from Ukraine, you know, there's other roles that uh, our government could play that we we should be thinking of. I've seen um, some of the actions this week as well, people following politicians and and making them, you know, making them uncomfortable, making them answer for themselves, and that's the sort of stuff that I think uh, needs to continue. But I. You know, was scrolling through Twitter and saw you post something that just just feels like so much just what my feeling is on on everything, which is just literally like, my God, what will it take to stop this? What actually will it take? I mean, fucking you and I and many other people have known that international law is a joke forever. But isn't there supposed to be some sort of obligation to interrupt this at this point? Like what actually is the point at which this stops? And I I don't know what the answer to that question is looking looking at it. Uh, it 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 seems as though, like I, I just, without the shifting opinion of of those in power in the West, I I actually don't see any other way <laughs> that this stops, and I'm I'm fully at a loss. It's just I I. I I cannot imagine being someone who has been elected watching this happen and not doing everything I could to make fucking the government just do the right thing. I just 
don't understand. I don't understand. I couldn't be that person. No, no. And those people need to be broken, frankly, and we can break them, right? So if you haven't sent 10 messages or emails to your local member of parliament and your provincial politics, do it, do it, do it. It's easy. Just do it or do it to the people who in the place where you grew up, if that person's a liberal or, or, you know, email Melanie Jolie or, or whatever, like, like harass these people, plan, plan more office occupations. This, the pressure, it feels so futile and it, and it, and it might be futile, but we have to keep that pressure up. And there are examples of it changing. It, you know, Macron coming out in favor of ceasefire is not something I had on my bingo card. I'm actually totally surprised by that. And that's not coming out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. That's because there has been it's not. intense pressure in France. And Macron is the first of the Western leaders to take a better position. It is a matter of time. In France, where they banned protesting. <laughs> I know on this issue, okay? In France, where they banned protesting on this issue. Hundreds of thousands of people out on the street week after week. And, and, and the president of France changing his position. It's amazing. It's amazing. Things and it's are possible. possible. And we can't, uh, we can't give up, as we say in French, on lâche pas. On lâche pas. On peut pas lâcher. And, you know, that's the, it, the only thing we have is this, this strength in the streets and other creative actions. So, you know, congratulations to the world beyond war. You folks are amazing. Those are activists uh, who've been united to shut down war industry, uh, businesses all over the country. Look up world beyond war. If you're looking to get involved in something, organize a local occupation of your, of your local MP's office or show up with, you know, painted blood on your hands and, and, and put them on the windows, like anything, 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 keep the pressure up. It will, it will, it will, it will, it will work. But I think we can hold that idea in our mind at the same time as the loss of a idea of what's going to take to change their minds.